you come let's just thank him lift up a voice this is biblical lift up a voice thank you father we praise you magnify you we're grateful thank you for being good to us thank you for redeeming our life from destruction thank you for setting us taking us out of the pit and setting us in the palace at the right hand of the father with jesus thank you for giving us the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace and here we stand not as victims not beaten down by life but victorious lord thank you that you've empowered us not to endure life circumstances but to soar like the eagles and i pray that tonight that you would do something to our strength levels yeah you would increase our strength oh you would mightily cause your wind to blow in this place and Oh, as we stretch our tent pegs and we stretch our wings and we expand our capacity here tonight. Oh, we too will soar like the eagles, catching the things that are blowing in the spirit right from your throne. And Father, here tonight, I believe that people will walk home challenged and encouraged. Oh, because you're a good God. And we say thank you one more time. We magnify you in this house. Magnify you above any circumstances circumstance, situation, dry, parched place that anyone in this room may be in, those who are watching. Our Father, I thank you that there's no limit in the Spirit. Oh, as we magnify you, so is your promises magnified and the experience and the power that comes with your promises are magnified in our lives. The effect of your power is increased. Ah, glory to God. I pray, Lord, for breakthrough here and a breakthrough there and a expanding to the left and a expanding to the right. Father, I thank you that capacity shall be increased this evening in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. You may take your seat, Tim. Thank you so much also. I'm going to ask Tony to stay on the keys. This is flow night here tonight, so keep on playing with me, please. I'm telling you, we're in a, a, a holy place. A while back, you know, just meditating on the story where Moses, he, he was presented with the burning bush and um, he heard the voice of the Lord and he was drawn near to see what was going on and as he drew near, he got to hearing. And how many know that's the case for all of us in here? As you draw near, you got to draw near to hear. But there was a word of instruction that um, God gave Moses and that was take off your sandals for the the ground that you're standing is holy ground. In other words, don't take the dirt, the muck on the street. Don't take the, the, the dirt of the world into this holy place. Take it off. Lay it aside. Every weight, every sin, lay it aside. Because holy ground is hearing ground. And holy ground is where you holy Every aspect of your life is yielded to Him. You're, you're at a moment when He deals with your heart to drop something aside and take that off, then you take it off. And I tell you, He'll get to speaking to you. What was He going to say? He's going to tell you what your next move is. He's going to tell you what to say and how to say what to say. He'll tell you where to invest and how to pray and who to pray for and when. He'll, he'll even tell you when to stop praying and when to start rejoicing because you got the victory. He'll show us and tell us every aspect that we need to know. But there's something key to you here in Acrely, and that's taking some things off. Take off those shoes. See, they didn't have paved, paved roads like, like we do today. There, there was dirty roads. If there was any bit of rain and any bit of, you know, uh, bad weather. I'll tell you what, the dust and the, the rainfall mixing, I mean, it's going to cause a bit of mud, right? And guess what happens? It gets on your sandals. So when you, come on, what did your mom say? First, first, first step in the, in the doorway, take your shoes off, son, you know, take them off. Why? Because she don't want dirty footprints all the way through the house. See, we can so easily drag the dirt of the world into our lives, into our homes, but we've got to take that stuff off. This is why church is so important. That's why his presence is so important. That's why coming come in to, to, to this place, not only in this corporate place where, you know, you can sense, who can sense the Holy Ghost? Who can sense the presence of the Lord? I mean, it was wonderfully led by the team and, and uh, man, we're just the holy place. You, you, you can't just, you don't, 
have to wait for the gathering, the assembly, to enjoy the holy place. You can go at any time. At least somebody should have got excited about that. Any time. Well, if you have a revelation of what happens in the presence of the Lord, I mean, my, liberty is found in the presence of the Lord. Freedom is found in the presence of the Lord. Refreshment is found in the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing. Well, when's that going to happen? When you make time, not find time, but make time for His presence. And when you do, whoo, times of refreshing are experienced. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you today that uh, you wage in a good warfare concerning the prophecies that you've heard is worth it. It's worth it. I'm going to say it again. You wage in a good warfare concerning the promises and the prophecies that you've received is worth it. Someone say it's worth it. It's worth, worth the fight. It's worth the walk of faith. In, uh, in Timothy, uh, Timothy spoke to uh, Paul. Sorry, Paul spoke to Timothy. In um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18, it says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Uh, King James says, By them, mightiest war, a good warfare. A good warfare. Hallelujah. How many know this war is mighty? How many know it's a good fight? The good fight of faith. Why, why is it a good fight? Because it's a fight that we always win. As long as we're using the sword of the Spirit. Whose sword? His sword. It's part of His armory. Put on the whole armor of God. Woo! Come on, you are... You, 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 but, but someone's got to fight. Someone's got to enforce. Someone's got to, someone has got to enforce. Now, uh, turn to Daniel real fast. Turn to Daniel. Everyone on track with what the Holy Ghost is saying. You waging a good warfare concerning the prophecies is worth the fight. I'm saying it's worth the fight. The things that the Spirit of God spoke to you in times past, they're going to come to pass. It shall all come to pass. Who believes that? Amen. Do you believe, do you, do you believe it? Do you believe it? I believe it. It's all coming to pass. I mean, right to the last bit of it. It's all coming to pass. Well, uh, Daniel he received a word, a prophecy, and when 70 years of Israel's captivity had been completed, Daniel didn't assume just because it was time for the prophetic word to come to pass that the prophetic word would come to pass. He didn't assume that God would automatically restore Israel and that God would liberate the Jews just because the prophetic time had come. No, just because Daniel knew the prophetic time was at the door, Daniel, who did, did I say David? Daniel, Daniel. Daniel, not, he knew that the prophetic time was at the door, but Daniel also knew <sighs> someone is going to open that door. And see, the the appointed time for the prophecy that God's spoken to you about, the promise He's given you, it may be at the door. The 70 years may be right here. You know, you understand what I mean? God may have said, hey, by the end of this year, such and such. And it was the Lord saying, He said, this is what's going to happen. All right, because God said it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. No, it's not just going to, it's not going to be automatic. It may be at the door, but someone's going to open that door. And Daniel knew this. And so what we see in Daniel chapter 9, oh, glory to God. Someone say hallelujah. They can put it on the screen. That's going to help me out. Daniel chapter 9, please, verse 3. Daniel 9, real fast. Daniel chapter 9, verses 3. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Are you there? Daniel chapter 9, verses... Praise the Lord. It says this. Then D Daniel did something. He set his face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Next, next verse, let's see this. And I prayed to the Lord, my God, and made confession and said, Oh, Lord, how great and awesome God who keeps his covenant. What did he do? He said, God, you promised it. You're a keeper of your covenant. How many are covenant? Mercy, you know this, right? Covenant is established on better promises, promises. Fundamentally, covenant is established upon pro promises. The better covenant which we're in, which is a different covenant 
which Daniel was talking about, is on better covenants, but for, uh, better promises. But fundamentally, covenant is established upon promises. See, God's promised you stuff. But God needs somebody like Daniel who's going to set his face, make a confession of faith. What's that? What is that? This is somebody waging a good warfare concerning the prophecies. See, Paul was saying, Timothy, you've got to do a Daniel. Prophecy is at the door. You've got to do this. It's at the door. The time has come, but you've got to move your mouth. Come on, somebody. You've got to work with the prophecy spoken. It shall come to pass. What's being said in 1947, the Word and the Spirit, those two emphases coming together is going to usher in the greatest move that has ever been witnessed on the face of this great British Isles. It will eclipse the Wesleyan and the, and the things that happened in the revivals in Wales through Evan Roberts and you know, all the things that took place through the, 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 the Wesleys. I mean, I'm telling you, that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. But somebody's got to start saying, do you know what? I'm going to make a confession of faith, a great confession of faith of my awesome great God who is faithful to keep His promises. Woo! Hallelujah. So who's going to answer the door? I'm going to answer, uh, answer the door. Look at verse 20 here. We're going to see a few other verses. Verses 20. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sins, I don't know there's things to lay aside. Take out a few sandals. As I was praying and uh, speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication. Someone say supplication. My supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. This word supplication, it is, it is earnest prayer. It is the white hot prayer that boils with passion and desire. It is the dynamic dunamis type of prayer. Come on, somebody. It's the explosive type of prayer. It is when you, when you pray and supplicate, uh, change begins to take place. It is the earnest, fervent, heated, come on, passionate type of prayer. It's not a modern day Pentecostal prayer. Oh God, if, you, if I'm not inconveniencing you too much, then would you? Maybe. I mean, could you? I mean, I'll wait and see. No, it's not that type of prayer. It's a bold prayer. God, I know you're good. I know you are faithful. I know you are awesome. You're a covenant-keeping God, and this is what you said. I plead my case with you. I plead the promises of God. I speak the promises of God. You shall not disappoint me. My expectation shall not be cut off in Jesus' name. My expectation will not be cut off. I will not be disappointed, for my God is faithful to bring a performance of what He has promised unto me. Woo! I'll lay and take my sandals off when I need to. I won't drag the world in. I won't contaminate what you're doing in my life or in my family's life and in my church's life. I confess my sins. Hallelujah. I, and present supplication before you. My God, for the holy mountain of my God. Next verse. Verse 21. Yes, while I was speaking in in prayer, see, the man Gabriel, the, the, a messenger came, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me. Come on, some swift things happening, amen. Encouragement, messengers coming just to help us, amen. Amen, swiftly reached me about the time of the evening offering, next verse. And it, he informed me and taught me. He started giving him instruction, further instruction. And said, oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Who receives that? Skill to understand. How many know understanding is key? People are destroyed because of lack of understanding. But you are skilled to understand the covenant. Skilled to understand the promises. Skilled to know how to take off your sandals. Skilled, come on, to wage a good warfare. Skilled to tap and enter that which God has said. So say, I'm skilled. I'm going to be used in these last days. Say, I'm going to be used in these last days. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Daniel took a hold of God's promises by faith. He spoke it. He prayed it. He confessed it. He repented. He humbled himself before the Lord. Amen. And made supplication to God. Supplication 
unlocks, supplication opens the door to receive impartations, skills that you could not seemingly receive any other way other than in the place of his presence. And this includes you maybe being a little bit of an oddity. Well, what do you mean? You're not fearing people anymore. You're fearing God. It's, um, it's like what we've been talking about. Evie just mentioned it. Lord, where's the fire? He says, where's, where's the altar? And if you're looking for a sacrifice, you're it. Because we are called to offer up reasonable worship. According to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, a reasonable sacrifice of worship would be you giving your living bodies as a living sacrifice. Hallelujah. You're giving up your body. It's not about you. It's not about you looking for the praises of men. It's you looking to make his name glorious. This is really what, what, what we're talking about, dying to self. And that's really the, the, the foundation of releasing a sacrifice of praise. Because you're not looking for people hand clapping you. You're not looking to please men. People are amazing when you live to serve them. But people will destroy you when you try to please them. When you see in the lives of men of God in the Old Testament and in the New, you see them not fearing men, you see them fearing God. They weren't living. If you live to please men, you'll die, you'll die by their words. But if you live to honor God, then you'll love men better. You'll respect people better. And really, it is not love at all when you're trying to please people. It's you using people to try and get them to heal broken wounds that you carry. You're using people to heal your own brokenness. It's not love at all. You're looking for them to do something for you so that you feel better and you're, you're feeling, feeling healed. Man, I'm telling you, we ought to live eyes on Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Uh, Andre, jump on the stage, please. Evie, you jump on the stage as well, please. Praise the Lord. Andre, you stand on this side. Praise the Lord. You stand on this side. I want you to hold this. Just hold. Don't drink it. I want you to hold this. Uh, Evie's got an empty cup. Andre's got a full cup of water. And I want you guys, uh, a bit of a race here today. Um, Evie, I want you to run that section and come back and jump on the stage. I want you to run around this section. Uh, but the, this middle section, you're running around that other section, all right? And uh, I want you to beat this guy. All right? Come on. Let's watch a woman, a, a, a lady, beat, beat a man. Now, the deal is you cannot drink that. You can't drop. You can, not, not even a little drop. Otherwise, you fail, and she wins. All right? You get disqualified. Go! Come on! Come on, let's give it up for Evie. Let's give it up for Evie. Woo! <laughs> Man, you're so slow. Why is he so slow? Here's the deal. The reason why Evie, give me your cup. The reason why Evie won is because she had, she had nothing in there. She's not, she's not, she, she wasn't looking at this. She was looking at the people. Because she was empty. She had nothing to protect. You hearing what I'm saying? He had something full. He wasn't looking at men. He didn't care if he came first or not. It wasn't about coming first. It was about protecting what he was carrying. What he was full of. See, for, for somebody who's filled with the Spirit, they don't care about men watching them. They don't care about the men, men, men ple being pleased and being, being praised by by people, they're a carrier. It's not about coming first. Jesus said, the greatest shall be last. Come on, somebody. We are carriers. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Do you want to enjoy that drink? You can go ahead and enjoy that drink. Come on, the greatest. You run your race. 
Not looking at people. He was looking at the contents of that cup the whole time. And look, he sowed it. That's what filled people do. They, they're givers. <laughs> oh, man. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, oh, you don't care who comes first. Your focus is on him on the inside, not on, not on other people. I want to share a, a familiar story before I, before I close this, this evening. And it's found in Mark's Gospel. Turn that real fast. Mark's Gospel, I'll be quick with this. Someone say, I'm not giving up on the pro- promises. I'm not giving up on the, on the prophecies that have been given unto me. In the name of Jesus, I'm running my race. Oh, I'm not going to run trying to please men. My eyes aren't on people. I don't, I'm not going to compare my race with others. If people are running faster than me, it's not about what they're called to do. It's about what I'm carrying. It's what's on the inside of me. It's, it's the promises and the pro- prophecies that I've got on the inside of me that bears witness with my spirit. And according to what's been planted on the inside of me, according to what I'm carrying, according to what I'm pregnant with, that determines my speed. See, when you're a carrier filled with the Holy Ghost, you're willing to slow down. You're willing to make course corrections. You're willing to yield and, and, and change. The, come on, somebody. But if you're like Abby, I mean, I mean, you know, come on. She's just like looking at everyone. Look at me. <laughs> oh, she's filled, by the way. Verse 22. Verse 21, Mark 5, 21. Now, the, now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue named uh, Jairus. I'm just going to refer to him as the ruler of the synagogue from now on. And when he saw him, he fell on his feet, fell at his feet. So the ruler, he's falling at Jesus' feet, and he begged him. Notice this. He begged him earnestly. See, passionate prayer. Passion. He wanted something. He was passionate. It was, it was this white, hot praying, asking, petition. Come on, somebody. And he begged him earnestly, saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. She's not dead yet, but she's, she's close to it. Uh, come and lay your hands on her that she may, that she may, be, she may be healed. Verse 24 says, So Jesus went with them, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And we know the story. Then, then they were interrupted. So Jesus has got you know, this, this ruler's hand, and, and basically he's following this ruler to his house where his daughter, who, who's had you know, a situation for, for, for a number of years, you know, and, and she's at the point of death. She's on the brink, about to die. And, and, but notice what Jesus does. Notice what the father does, what the ruler does. He does something very wise. He takes, he takes the answer. He takes the one he's just encountered to the house, to his house where um, there is death. And this is something that we've all be, we've got to be a master at, is taking the answer, which is Jesus, to that in our life which is dying. You know what I mean? Um, because God has not called us to, you know, lead a revolution. God has called us to be revivalists. Re- revolutionists, you know, those guys who, you know, just pioneering revolutions. They're, they're, they're just adamant to prove everyone wrong. But how many know we're not out to prove people wrong? We're out to bring light wherever we go. And that's what revival's all about. And so there's a tendency, you know, when you have a, you know, conference and, you know, like prevailing prayer conference or, you know, you go someplace and, you know, where there's a gathering of, you know, tens of thousands of people and it's like, man, it's fire and the worship and the lights and the atmosphere and the Holy Ghost and, man, this place is alive and, whoa, things are happening and you think, whoa, man, this meeting in compared to my church, my church is dead. My church is really like dying. Well, what do you do? See, it's far easier to leave a place that, that is dying and go, see, the, the father could have gone and said this. father could have said this. Because we know the story. He gets interrupted on the way back to the house. A woman with the issue of blood came, pressed through the crowd, touched the hem of his garment. Virtue came out of him. Jesus stopped his, his, his pursuit to the ruler's home, stops on the way. And, uh, and then... They get news that his daughter dies. 
So the father could have gone, well, that's it. It's, it's dead. It's like it was dying. It was getting worse. And then I, then I started following Jesus. And I started walking with Jesus. And it, it's like things got worse when I was walking with Jesus. I mean, my door went from, from like close to, but she wasn't dead yet, to, to dead. Jesus, and there's no need. And even people said, later on, verse 35, when he was still speaking, some came from the, rule, uh, from the rule of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Why even bother? I mean, the things like it was dying anyway. We all knew that it was going to die. Why even bother? I mean, why, you know, you this whole Jesus stuff, walking with him, praying, fasting, believing, sowing, you know, tithing, you know, um, praying in the spirit, going to church, going to, you know, the, the life groups and, and uh, 6 a.m. prayer and all that. Like, what? Why bother? Like, come on. Look for yourself. Stuff is dying all around you. And the, the devil would love to whisper that to you. Someone said, I'm not going to quit on the prophecies that have been spoken to me. <laughs> Woo, this is a word for somebody. If just one person came tonight to hear this, maybe that's you on the, uh, behind, behind, behind there somewhere, I don't know, wherever you may be, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's so easy, it's so easy just to go and say, okay, wife, Let's just make another baby because we just lost one. No, I'm going to take the one I've just encountered and I'm going to keep on going back to the house because I believe he's the resurrection and the life. And when I get Jesus in the middle of that death situation, we're going to experience some breathing. We're going to see some life. Hallelujah. He's the way. I remember Brother Hagen, they had some national meetings and they, they had a whole bunch of these were national, national in America, national meetings, prayer meetings. And it was like nothing was happening. And they had consistent meetings over and over and over and over again. And just like nothing was happening. So they had a big meeting with all the leaders and they said, it just why why even bother? Why 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 should we even carry on? Why why even bother? We ought to just, you know, just stop what we're doing. And brother said no. And then they asked him, Brother Hagen was just there, very polite. Until he was asked, Brother Hagen, what do you think we should do? You're a man of God, man of faith. What do you think we should do? He said, I think we should make our meetings more spiritual. <laughs> That's what I think we should do. I think we need to, I, I think we need to just get, I need to, we need to get the Holy Ghost in the mix of all of this. What do you reckon? So we'll bring Jesus right in. Everyone stand up right now. Everyone stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, that which is eaten against, eaten on uh, prophecies, Whatever it is, locusts, the canker worm. Lord, you're obligating yourself to restore any lost harvest, just like you said. Just like you said in the book of Joel, that you would deal wondrously with your children. Those petitioners, those supplicators, those intercessors, those prayers, those confessors of truth, those who are going to plead their case. And Lord, there's a room full of people here. There's people watching who are determined to wage a good warfare concerning what you've said. Lord, we don't, we, we're going to keep on walking with you. We're going to keep on believing you. We're going to keep on pressing on no matter if it goes from, from, from bad to worse. It's going to get better if we keep on walking. We keep on bringing Jesus in the mix. Keep on allowing the Holy Ghost to burn like he burns in our midst and burn the dross and burn and create something new in our midst. Father, we consecrate it. We give it to you. And we say, Lord, thank you for infusing me here tonight. Oh, just pray a little bit. Thank you for infusing me here tonight. Infusing me with fresh vision, fresh encouragement. Father, I want to thank you for the spirit of courage landing on every person here, here tonight. Stir in their hearts to keep on going. We will not quit in Jesus' name. Oh, Gisa, I, I, I sense this as well. Don't compare your story with someone else's story. Your story is a story of glory. You know that? But it, how he's going to do it is however he sees fit to do it in your lives. The lady who pressed through the crowd, she had an issue of blood for all those years. She didn't supplicate. 
She didn't beg Jesus. She wasn't walking with Jesus, so to speak, like the ruler of the synagogue was. Come on now, she wasn't laboring, so to speak. She got, from one touch, she got her situation turned around instantaneously. Just because somebody's got their breakthrough through one touch, by one touch, don't minimize what God wants to do through him walking with you. Sometimes you got to walk with him. And I'm not saying that this is going to, you know, you got to, you know, walk painfully through, you know, the valley of death. No, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, there's a walk of faith. And there's much produced through the walk. Amen. Especially if you've been around the, th- the things of the Spirit for any, uh, you know, a long period of time. Yeah, maybe initially there was instantaneous miracles to encourage you because that's where you were. But for others, it's not necessarily like that instant turnings. He wants to see, are you going to walk with me? Are you going to keep on walking with me? When I take you by the hand (laughs) and on the outside, it it looks like it's actually getting worse. No, are you willing? He's going to test you. Are you going to walk by faith or walk by sight? Jesus said this, this sickness is not unto death, John 11, verse 4. And yet, Lazarus dies. Yet Jesus said, he's not going to die. He said, Lazarus won't die. This sickness that is on Lazarus, it's not going to cause him to die. But guess what? Lazarus died. What? Did Jesus miss it with his confession? No. No, he knew the moment he said that, no matter if his body gave up, the man's coming up. The man's going to live. And then verse 42, 43, somewhere around there, same, same chapter, John 11. He said, Father, thank you that you've heard me. Thank you that you heard me in verse 4 when I said that this sickness is not unto death. I really don't have to say anything, but I'm going to say a few words for the benefit of those standing around me. Lazarus, come forth. Get in line with verse 4. This sickness is not unto death. Guess what? Lazarus came out. Resurrection and life. Hallelujah. If you are in a place where the whispers, come on, the devil's been whispering. Kath, Kath. The devil's been whispering in your ear. I was praying, and when I was even preparing this, I, 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 like you came up in my spirit. There's a word of the Lord for you right here. Hallelujah. Mark, Mark 5, I lost my place. I'm going to get there very fast. Mark 5. They say, people, the circumstance, devils, demons, they say, why even bother? Why bother the teacher? Why bother? Why even bother with believing for restoration. Why even go there? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler, and he says to those who need to hear this, do not be afraid, only believe. Do not be afraid. Have you lay hands on it? Do not be afraid, only believe in the name of Jesus. I speak and I release an impartation of strength in the name of Jesus, the strength to believe and be reinforced, to keep on believing and confessing and standing on the covenant that he said. He said it, he's spoken it, he will bring it, bring it to a flourishing finish. Lift up your hands and thank him. Lift up your hands across this auditorium and thank him here tonight. Thank you, Father. Only believe. Only believe. Do not be afraid. Only believe. Woo! Thank you, Holy Ghost. Spirit of God, thank you in this place. You're ministering, ministering to people. Oh, Lord, we go out of this place encouraged. We go out of this place knowing, yeah, but hey, the plan, the things are set in motion. Oh, yes, the activity in the realm of the spirit, angels, angelic beings, spirits, ministering spirits are aiding us, supporting us, the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, you are with us, helping us every step of the way. Yeah, Anna also, but Anna Monko, for some in this room, for some in this room, he's equipping you with a skill to understand, a skill to understand, ha, 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 ha. Oh, glory to mana. Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about souls. We're talking about souls. Hallelujah. Think about it for a second. Think about it for a second. Oh, my. 
the ruler's daughter died. Why? A body without the spirit is a corpse. A church without Jesus, without the spirit, is a corpse. It has a form but no effective function. Come on, we need the Holy Ghost in everything that we do. Would you agree? But a church with breath, spirit, oh, glory to God. That's a church with a mouth that preaches the gospel. Repent and believe. That's a church with hands that lay hands on the sick and see them recover. That's a church with feet that go into the byways and the highways and preaches the gospel wherever they go. Come on. That's a church with form but also with function. Why? Because we are willing to say, Jesus, we need you in the house. We need you in this ministry. We need you in this church. Oh, we need in our homes, house fires across the city. Come on, we need the Spirit of God, the breath of God everywhere. We need it in the teams. We need it in everything that we do. And we have Him. But the power lies in you acknowledging Him. Hallelujah. My last scripture for tonight is this, Philemon verse 6. Philemon verse 6, it says, For the, 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 the effective communication or the sharing of your faith will become effectual by the by the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Can you see that? Yeah. Hallelujah. Philemon verse 6. When we acknowledge every good thing that's in us, our sharing, our communication of faith becomes effectual. Let's get on the screen so that we can see it here. I'm telling you, you just acknowledge the Holy Ghost. Grab your belly once again and say, Father, thank you for releasing your Holy Ghost. I'm going home tonight, not without Thank you, Lord, that this church is filled with your spirit. We've got form, but we've got function. This house, oh, my house, this body, for I'm a temple of the Holy Ghost. My legs go to the highways and the byways to preach. My mouth preaches the gospel. My hands lays hands on the sick and sees them recover. Father, I will be used in these last days to see mighty, mighty recovery. Mighty, mighty recovery. Mighty recovery of of the lost harvest and, and, and people coming into the kingdom for such a time as this. For this reason, I was born. And Father, I want to thank you. Woo! I leave encouraged, equipped by your spirit in Jesus' precious name. Thank you for coming out tonight. Until next time, keep on rejoicing. Thank you so much for joining us here on this um, broadcast. And this live stream program, uh, we're, we're grateful that you, that you have. Uh, if you want to sow into the ministry, you can do that. Participate in the, the giving here. Go on our, faith, our website, faithlife.com forward slash donate. And you can see exactly how to do that. For, for the rest of us, there's going to be a steward right at the, uh, right at the uh, double doors there. And you can drop off your offering. Uh, not drop them off. It's part of your worship. So we're going to continue worshiping as we leave this place. Amen. Keep on rejoicing until next time. We love you very much. We'll see you on Sunday. We've got a special guest minister coming to minister the word to us. Uh, so it's something you really don't want to miss. Amen. Love.